everybody to season one, episode two of the Kelvin Roundtable. Again, with me is my co host, Ryan Souders, and of course, always along with us, Jeff Phoebus. Our first segment brought to you by Meyer, one of our title sponsors. We're always thrilled that they have committed to us and, and kept us moving forward even during these tough times. So we want to thank Meyer for this fr- first segment. As our segments go, Ryan and I like to talk a little bit about sports, a little bit about life as uh, around Calvin's campus. And we have three different segments, and we're going to get started right away. Ryan, the first segment I'm calling sports, question mark. And I guess I want to start out by this is where is sports now in the, in the American landscape? That's a big question given COVID and we can start with pro and move down to college. What do you think? Man, first of all, it's great to be back. Episode two at the round table. Um, that is a great question. You know, I think uh, my own answer individually changes week to week. I mean, as you know, um, you know, I'm a big pro sports fan, Chicago guy, Cubs season ticket holder, uh, attended uh, zero games this year. And I think for a while, you know, we craved sports so deeply and wanted it back. And now that it is and it looks a little bit differently, I feel like, you know, we're trying to figure out our, our own day-to-day lives. So I, I don't know. I mean, Jim, I'm curious your thoughts on this. What is what is the role of sport right now? Where are sports headed? Um, I mean, obviously different times, but, you know, for a while it seemed like sports kind of brought us out of things. Where do you see us with them now? You know, it's really interesting. As you know, I, I love uh, history and I love thinking about, you know, most of the time that sport has brought us through uh, wars or really tough times in cities and think like, Tigers in 1968 um, with the, with the uh, civil unrest and civil rights movement and that, how that kind of got through the city. That's why Willie Horton has a statue there. Um, this one seems, seems strange to me. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I get excited to come even to watch your team or, or um, our team's inter-squad scrimmage, but it wears off quicker. And um, it seems like uh, there's a little black cow, but – but I don't want to say I can't imagine what if we didn't have sports to talk about, because um, you know we talk about the bubble, we talk about um, you know the U.S. Open in golf, and 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 we're going to have a Super Bowl, and and so I know we want to talk about it, but it just doesn't feel the same as when we when we're when we're maybe, maybe it's because we're not as united right now around the um, the issue as we usually are around a national emergency. I don't know if you're feeling that way. Yeah, I think I think for sure there. I mean, right? We'd be lying if we said there weren't maybe some um, political questions or things that might weigh into that. I think one of the positives that I've seen as a coach, at least, is you know maybe not on a national level of interest in fandom, but like I think athletes are more invested and involved in sports than they have been in a while. You know, is that it was taken away for a little bit, and I think at least our athletes at Calvin, their investment is so huge. Uh, and maybe that's it. They feel like there's not time to, to follow the professional sports. I, I don't know. It's a, it's a curious one for me. I wish there was an answer. Um, right. Sports have done some great things, right? You see, um, you know, lots of leagues and individuals for calls of justice. Um, you see bringing actions in into politics, um, the faith engagements from athletes. I think there's never been a larger platform for athletes. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think – Good thing, but maybe sometimes that takes away from the sport too. I, I don't know. It's a. I think there's a lot of different variables. Certainly, no. And, and it's it always interests me as 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 much as I work in sport um, as a practitioner. I still I still like sometimes be a critic of sport and think, man, what are we doing? You know, and we you, that's one of our segments. But you know, you you referenced what's going on on your team, and and my my second topic tonight for us is a thing I want to call goals. Now, we could go with the goals as in soccer, but they're not goals. They're kind of like, what are our goals? And I, I, I broke it down into three things, and we're really going to stay with intercollegiate athletics here. And I want our take on, what's your take on what is the goal? Um, what are the goals for coaches right now? Let's just specifically say fall coaches. I don't care if it's division one, two, or three. We're talking intercollegiate sports. What are what are you trying to do, but what do you think coaches are trying to do? And and for some they're playing and some they're only practicing. And what what would be your goal and maybe what would you extrapolate that to uh, other coaches? 
Yeah, I think they're probably multifaceted. You know, our first goal is we want to be together, um, socially distant and respectfully. And, you know, we're fortunate Calvin's testing. So that that allows us for maybe some liberties that, that maybe other institutions don't have. But that's our first goal is just be together. You know, we, we were not able to have a spring season, uh, obviously many or you know none of our sports were, were really able to have spring season so i think just being together there's something about being together that's special um i think the second one is we want to cast a vision for where we're headed i think that's the biggest thing over and over again that we're telling our guys is this is what this is for this is what we're after be it this spring 2021 lord willing or something down the road fall 2020 that like our program vision doesn't change because of COVID in terms of who we are, what we're after. Um, and so I think our our young men and women need to be constantly reminded of that. So we want to be together. We want to cast a vision. And then I think the third thing is we want to compete, even if it's just against ourselves. I think part of sport that is so different from other things is that there are winners and losers. You want to get out. You want to show your best. And so we're doing that in various different ways. Obviously, we're intra-squatting, but I think we're doing fun competitive games in training. Um, you know, we've maybe done that a little differently than other programs with certain uh, drills that we have and different rewards and those kind of things. But I think, I think all of our coaches to some degree would say, we want to be together. We want to cast a vision of where we're headed um, because there seems like there's so much uncertainty. So I think as a coach, I want to be very clear about where we're going and then we want to compete. Um, if we're doing those things, we're probably growing. We're probably having fun. So um, certainly different goals than the, than the ones with like 30 O's that you're used to um, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe listening to in La Liga games. But um, yeah, I, th I think in talking with some of my coaching colleagues as well, like we're all after some form of those things. Yeah. You know, and, and I'll, and I'll put it back to me, you know, when we start talking about athletics, um, I have a, I have a little broader vision maybe as an athletic director and, you know, I, I've asked myself what, you know, what, what, do, what do we want to try to accomplish this fall and through this year? And I think there's, there's this, the stuff that you took talked about, you know, our goals doesn't don't change for the student athlete and their experience. Now the things that, that, um, you know, we don't have a game, but we have practice. We don't have this, but we might have something else to accomplish those goals. But there's some part of me of just saying as an athletic department, we just want to keep going. We want to be a presence. We want to be for athletics at Calvin. I do think it's integral to our campus life. And I want to say, my one of my goals is let's just keep it going and and it's it, it it's it's as difficult as fall as we've been through but the rewards are there to see our kids and i'm shocked how hard your kids and all our teams when i watch them play inner squad i'm thinking man these kids are getting after it and and that makes me proud but it, i think it's all part of of just keeping going um and, and, sure, and going ask, forward let me interrupt you. Sorry to ask you this. So I see oh. it kind of within a bubble as a coach with our team and then, you know, a couple of other colleagues and, and we talk about their teams. How do you feel about it as, a, as an administrator kind of generally uh, up, up line a bit? And then as a faculty member, you know, what are the role of sports institutionally for our students? I mean, I know you talk about keep going. What do they provide us um, institutionally? What do they provide our programs? I mean, what are you seeing at kind of a 30,000 foot level that, to be honest, I'm probably losing uh, <laughs> degrees in, in a day by day interaction? You, you know, the, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in, in obviously, I've dedicated my life to it in, in that idea of Athletics plays an integral role on campus for um, community. Um, it, it allows very talented, uh, uh, athletic, athletically talented kids to pursue something they with passion in an environment, in our case, a very um, a Christian-filled uh, environment. And so, um, like, when I look at it and say, what would a college campus be without sports? I think you see across the nation, people have struggled with that. And I don't think, you know, some people say, well, maybe sport leaves college campuses. Now, I, I think it's just the opposite. I think it will it will cement them in um, because we those traditions, those those community builders, those rallying cries uh, tend to unite even in a very divided country. Well, Ryan, we're, we're going to keep moving in, and we'll have this last one. And, and uh, this last segment is. You know, I've taken phrases that you and I say to each other during a week or during a, a year, and one of them is 
uh, we say you were either wrong now or you were wrong then. Um, you were wrong now or you were wrong then. It's it's kind of a frustration of when, you know, Tony Fauci, right? He was either wrong now or he's wrong then. Now, I know that's a terrible example right now when talking about masks, but that would be an example of one. I'll give you another example, right? This Man, Chicago- blew him out of the gate. Jeez. How about this? Mitch Trubisky, Chicago Bears, the five and one Chicago Bears. I don't know. We're going to have Annie Needs on here in a little bit. I don't know if she's a Bears fan from Peru, Illinois, but but Mitch Trubisky, either the Bears are wrong when they picked him or how by not playing him. I mean, you got to know what you have at this point, right? So there's an example. You can give me 10 seconds on Mitch Trubisky and if he, they were wrong now or wrong then. I, I don't have to. They were wrong then. We never should have drafted him. I said it from day one. Nick Foles is back. We are five and one. I'm not drinking the Kool Aid. I am mixing and serving it, Jim. I mean, how, your Lions beat Saxonville. That's about what you guys have going for you. Uh, we we had to beat the guy with the bad mustache, uh, Minshew, or what his name is. I can't remember. All right, my second one. My second one. You were wrong now, or you were wrong then. Big Ten. What changed from August to October? Either you were wrong then or you're, you're wrong bringing Big Ten sports back. In fact, you're not bringing all Big Ten sports. I know your colleagues um, in soccer and some other sports. What do you think about the Big Ten? Jim, I'm going to punt on this one for two reasons. <laughs> I don't have a dog in the fight in the Big Ten. I don't, I don't really care. Yeah. And I think you asked this question so that you could answer whether you were wrong then or wrong now. So, you know, as a Wolverine who went to Calvin, has never done anything at Michigan, has no real association with Michigan. My dad's why, don't a graduate. Us, why don't you give us your take? Well, we're going to have Coach Deemer on. And he's a, he, he's, well, here, here's my thing. I, I I don't think there's a right answer here because I think it moves so fast. When we start asking those questions, you sound um, like Will Bond. You're not taking a side. I, I know. I because I look at it and go, maybe they were right then and they're right now. It could be a varying degrees. I, I guess I'm going to err on the side of I'm going to support my fellow athletic administrators. They were trying to do the best by the people, and now they're trying to do the best by people. And I think we won't be able to answer that question. My my final. You were wrong now, or you were wrong then, and 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 this one takes a little bit of imagination. The NCAA championship fields in Division Three are being reduced. Um, let's say they get rid of at automatic qualifiers and just take the thirty-five best players. Is that wrong, or would you say, um, you know, hey, the idea of having every conference gets a bid is a wrong thing or is it right thing to do? No, uh, I, th- I think you're wrong now. I don't think you're wrong then. I mean, and I'm someone, you yeah. know, that, that gets fired up about the pool C or at large bids, but I think there's something special about competing in an NCAA tournament and there's enough opportunities um, for coaches to go and, and get themselves those bids. Um, and I may be talking out of both sides of my mouth. You know, I've been upset in the past, you know, where we were a bubble team, but I think there's something special, you know? Um, otherwise I just think you have to make it very clear if you're going to take away at larges, uh, as to reason why you're doing that. And I think division three tries to model itself athletically after division one and two. And so to be given AQs at that level and not ours would be tough to understand. Um, but I think if there's sound reasoning, uh, the committee could work through it. I don't, I don't know where, when were they wrong? Or are you going to come out here and say, I'll wait to see what they do. And then I'll make a decision as well. No, I, I, I think we. W- <laughs> I want the best teams in. And, oh, he's uh, disagreeing. Okay. You know, so hey, fun fun segment here. We're gonna move on to our next segment with Jeff Phoebus. All right, we're back with uh, with the uh, first segment that uh, Jeff Phoebus, our sports information director, does with us. This segment brought to you by In on Time, matching your requirements and your needs. To our fleet and warehouses gives you the flexibility you're looking for in a logistics provider. Unmatched Service Reliable makes In On Time your complete logistics solution. This week's segment by Jeff Phoebus is called Phoebus's Tales of Family Traditions at Kelvin. Jeff, give us some family traditions. Yeah, well, thank you, Jim. Uh, Yeah, you had given me uh, this assignment to kind of come up with – 
one of these uh, family connections of Kelvin uh, knighthood, so to speak. And there's a lot of examples, and perhaps we can touch on some of the others down the road. Uh, but the one that I chose uh, is the Capel family. And uh, there are so many rich little nuggets in the family when it comes to uh, Calvin Athletics. And I think uh, just to be proper, we'll start with ladies first. So it's uh, the daughters or the sisters. We'll get to uh, their father in a bit. But uh, Jill Capel uh, and Paige Capel, who are actually the second all-time leading sister tandem in Kelvin women's soccer history. Might get to that all-time leading tandem at another point down the road. But uh, combined, uh, Jill and Paige Capel uh, had 327 career points, 126 goals. Uh, Jill is the all-time Kelvin leader. I'd kind of forgotten about this, an assist uh, with 49 in her career. Uh, did a year of track, actually, her freshman year back in 2004. I had to look that one up. I just remember her running the 400 meters. She actually um, took six in the conference meet as a freshman, just did it the one year. Probably the only time she's ever run, uh, you know, at a at a high school or college level in track. So I always gave her a lot of props for stepping outside uh, her comfort zone, probably, because she had played high school soccer all throughout her uh, spring career. But, yeah, she was an All-American as a senior, a two-time league MVP, uh, helped the women's soccer team go to the national uh, tournament in 2015 and in 2016. In fact, helped Calvin get to uh, the national quarterfinals her senior year in 2006. Um, then younger sister Paige uh, played from 2012 through 2015, and uh, she was a three-time first-team all-league selection in soccer, led the league in scoring in both 2015 and 2014, and uh, her senior year helped Calvin uh, advance all the way, like her older sister, to the national quarterfinals in women's soccer. And uh, she was an all-region selection. So they are the daughters of Barry Capel, who's a 1977 Calvin graduate. And uh, Barry's quite a distinctive Calvin athlete. Uh, of course, he kind of was part of that uh, Mark Veenstra uh, tradition that came into Kelvin. They were high school teammates at Unity Christian High School. They were part of that Unity Christian team that a lot of people out here in Hudsonville, where I live, still talk about today that went undefeated all the way to the state finals, where they uh, lost a heartbreaker to Dearborn Divine Child, which was coached by uh, the legendary Bill McCartney, who a lot of people remember went on to be an assistant football coach at the University of Michigan, head coach at the University of Colorado, and then the founder of Promise Keepers. So uh, Barry went on to be a four-year uh, basketball player for the Kelvin men's basketball team, played alongside Mark Veenstra, and I just did uh, the four-year combination record. Uh, they were 74-15 and 15 during those four years, had four straight MIAA titles, and they were part of the last group in MIAA, uh, well, athletics history during this lengthy period uh, that were not allowed to compete in the NCAA tournament in team competition. In fact, the year after they finished up, uh, the ban was lifted. And of course, Albion promptly went to the NCAA Final Four in men's basketball. Um, Barry was an all-conference first team selection, 1977. I think one of the most distinctive uh, moments of his career, a lot of people have talked about this one. Uh, Mark Veenstra had 56 points, which was the all-time single game scoring record for a number of years. And it was in a 109 to 108 double overtime win at Adrian at the old Ridge gymnasium, which was kind of down in a pit, a hole. Jim would remember. remember that. Well. Yeah. You played down there and uh, they were down Kelvin by a couple of points with about two seconds left in regulation. And uh, our former uh, track women's track and women's basketball coach who was an all American javelin thrower, Greg Appman, who happened to be the point guard on that team through a length of the court pass that Mark Veenstra laid in at the buzzer to send it to overtime. So then in overtime, it goes back and forth. Barry Capel hits a turnaround jumper from about 15 feet on the baseline at the buzzer to win the game, 109-108. And uh, that was part of a key win that helped uh, them win the MIAA title that year. So that was, uh, that was quite something. So what Barry didn't get to do is play in the NCAA tournament, but his two uh, younger brothers, Bruce and Brad Capel, both got to do it. And, of course, leave it to little brother, who I'll get to at the end, to cap it all off with something that they never got to do. Uh, Bruce played uh, at Kelvin from 78 through 82. He was an all-conference first-team selection in 1982, uh, part of MIAA championship teams in 1980 and 81, both 
were teams that were NCAA tournament teams. In fact, he was part of that Calvin team in 81 that played Hope four times and had that infamous uh, playoff game to determine at Middleville High School at Middleville High School to determine the NCAA tournament representative from the MIAA. And uh, Calvin won that on, I think it was a Tuesday night. Maybe it was a Wednesday night. And then uh, after winning that game by two points, uh, Calvin had to go right down to Wittenberg University where uh, they lost a couple of days later. Um, one of the other Tuesday. interesting it fun facts. What's the hat? It was a Tuesday night because it was a school night and I wasn't allowed to go. <laughs> there you go. So, and of course, your dad was an assistant coach back then. Uh, Bruce's son, Matt Capel, has the distinction, and I was there, and I think you were too, of scoring the first ever points in a basketball game at Benord Arena. Uh, some people might remember that there was a JV basketball game. I think it was on a Tuesday night, the night before we had our first varsity game, so that was against uh, Trine. Um, I can't remember who that JV game was against. It was not against trying, but the first two points of the game were scored by Matt Capella on the Kelvin men's JV team that year. And uh, how appropriate that uh, someone with those rich Kelvin bloodlines uh, scored the first two points in our beautiful arena. And then last but not least is uh, Brad Big, as we call him, Big Mama Capel, who was the backup post player on Kelvin's 1992 national championship men's basketball team. Brad is currently a painter in his post-Calvin career, and very appropriate that he is because he did a lot of good work down in the paint as a uh, as a six-six oh. power forward backup post player. And uh, you know, we we saw those uh, folks, Brad, Bruce, and Barry, sometimes combine on these uh, Gus Macker three-on-three basketball teams for a number of years. Um, they always did extremely well in the uh, in the half court. So. There you have it, the Capel family. Uh, what a rich tradition uh, in Calvin Athletics history. Uh, thanks, Jeff. That, that That's a wonderful thing, I, I, how you have all that down. And you had to research a little bit. I know my interse my intersection with that family has always been really just been a great experience. Uh, I played golf uh, in and around them at, at Sunnybrook Country Club. And the, the, the Capels were great. The men were at choosing teammates. Um, Brad Capel played with Steve Hondard and Barry played with Mark Veenstra. That that's a good time to go to Calvin when those guys are going over there to play. So I think they did a good job. Coach Souders, you you had a chance to, I think to you knew Jill in a different way, I think, uh, but also have seen her play. And you were around when Paige played. Any thoughts? My only thought on Jill was she was one of the best uh at Calvin that I have seen at going to get the ball in the air for for a woman soccer player on corner kicks. I always thought we had a good chance when, when she was in there. So uh, any reflections on Paige and, and Jill have you, have you known them? No, you know, it's interesting. Um, Jill actually lived with my wife, Casey, before she got married and obviously before Case got married. So um, we would talk soccer, but as I got to know Jill and Paige, it was significantly more off of the field um, than on the field. And that's how I've gotten to know uh, their dad, Barry, even. And so, um, you know, one of the things I think, you know, you talk about rich family bloodlines in terms of excellence on the, on the athletic pitch, court, pool, track, whatever. Uh, one of the other things, I think just a, an incredibly high character quality family. Um, and that was more my takeaway is just, um, you know, people that you're proud to associate as, as alums of the institution or alums of your program or whatever. So um, certainly competitive. And I got to see that with, with Jill and uh, Paige, certainly, but even more just high character and really, really proud, excuse me, that they are uh, alums, not only of the institution, but uh, specifically with uh, from the soccer wing to be honest with you. All right. Well, super. Um, our next segment will be an uh, interview with Coach Brian Deemer, and that will be followed by an interview with his star senior, Annie Needs. Um, so we'll be resetting it for that in just a few minutes. I'm here by uh, Kelvin Head, men's and women's cross-country coach Brian Deemer here on the Kelvin a roundtable podcast, and this interview is brought to you by Vredo Oak Heating and Cooling. Vredo Oak Heating and Cooling has served West Michigan for 54 years. They are a leading heating and cooling contractor and the best choice for your home. They install quality systems and back them up with guarantees to protect your investment. Contact us today for a free estimate at www.vredovog.com. So, Brian, uh, joining us here on the interview, thanks for uh, for stopping in. And uh, 
Yeah, it's uh, you've had a cross country season so far. You're one of the teams that are out there doing it. Uh, just your thoughts on, uh, uh, you know, recalibrating and regathering together and uh, having a season in the midst of this pandemic that we're in. It has been a wonderful season. We have had a lot of growth and a lot of development. And uh, this last meet in Muskegon this past Saturday just showed that that we have really done a great job this uh, this fall of uh, developing and uh, stretching out and and becoming so much better than what uh, what we could have done without a season. So just uh, let, we'll talk about the women's side because you're touching a little bit about about on the teams here. Uh, our our guest uh, on the show this evening is Annie Needs, and she had a tremendous race on Saturday. I think you guys had uh, nine of the top ten spots. You had a team score of 17 points. She led the way, uh, had a time of 1814, which is her fastest time uh, in cross country in a 5K course by nearly 10 seconds. And I know courses kind of vary. So sometimes, you know, comparing times from course to course or race to race can be a little arbitrary, but still a tremendous race for her. And, you know, we had talked over the weekend and what kind of a race she she ran. Can you just describe what type of race uh, tactically that she ran, how she put it all together? Well, Annie is really maturing as a racer, and um, you know that's that started, of course, with getting in shape, putting the work in over the summer, and actually over the over the last spring as well to um, to just be fit. And so she has found out that she has she has more in her tank than what she ever realized before, and so she's daring to stretch herself out a little bit more and um, just running with more courage. And um, it was really neat on Saturday. There was a, a woman who went out really strong and um, Annie and Sadie went along with her, but this, this uh, woman just stretched them out and uh, they were at the point where they could have, you know, broken off, and, uh, and just not being able to stick with that kind of pace and, and just get too far away. Once you lose contact, it's really hard to get it back. But Annie uh, is almost like she threw out a bungee cord and, you know, just rode with that girl uh, probably about, it, it even got out to be about 20, 20 meters behind her, but never let it get away. And so that shows the maturity that she stuck with it. She believed it. And um, all of a sudden she started pulling closer and closer to that, that woman. And, um, and then as she, as she got up with her, she counter surged and, um, and started putting on some pressure of her own. And so I just don't remember any, as doing that kind of racing before you know it's always been hey hang on with what you have and uh you know whatever ends up in the wash is what you get but she just she put a counter surge in and uh, and that woman just tried like crazy to hang with could not hang with annie and then uh and then then annie was after about three quarters of a mile of her trying to hang with her she just, she, she broke her and uh, going down a hill and then going up another hill and they still had 600 meters to the finish line. So it was a beautiful race, very mature racing. Annie has really, really grown and developed. Well, she's part of a, a really solid one-two punch for your team up, up front. You mentioned Sadie Herringa and Sadie took first place in the opening Invitational of the year that you competed at, the Olivet Invitational back in mid-September. And Sadie was named National Runner of the Week. Uh, that's a really nice one-two combo that you have up there. Can you talk about that? And then how some of the pack behind them now, you're working with them to try to narrow that gap uh, behind and just kind of lower that time spread. And it looks like it's starting to happen. Yeah. Sadie is a very talented runner, and, and she also has put in a ton of work. And so she's realizing the, um, the results of a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of miles, and um, that's really fun to see. Um, in a sense, I wish I had three more weeks because I think that Sadie is, is coming into her own. She's just going through just a little bit of a, a, a training 
um, uh, result. And, um, and so she's just a little bit back, but, um, I think that if we had weeks and we had regionals and nationals, yes, I think that we would be very, very strong. So, uh, but we have this, this abbreviated season and we're thrilled to death that we have it. And, uh, and we're doing really well with what we have. It'll be interesting to see once what happens this weekend. So moving over to, uh, the men's side, uh, just found out that Justin Verano, a senior, has been named National Runner of the Week by the United States Cross Country uh, Coaches Association, and he is one of three National Runners of the Week that you've had this year. Uh, Jonathan Ellis was one. Uh, he did that after your invitational that he won at Olivet. And uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm trying to come up with uh, um, our ma- um. Let's see here. Who was it? Who who was our number two guy? He's really come on this year. Brandon Nepper. Brandon Nepper, who's a sophomore. So he uh, he ended up doing extremely well in our own invitational, won the race. And um, maybe you can just talk about those three and just the progression of the men's team this year. Well, going to Justin, he just he just uh, was our top runner this past Saturday at Muskegon, and I am so proud of him. He has he has really come around you know he was uh he was a very very good runner in high school came here to calvin and um and uh, got off to a great start but then he went through a little bit of a struggle for um for a year and a half and um and just you know some low iron and just some some uh, difficulties in being able to do the kind of running that he wanted to do and he stuck with it and he didn't give up on it. And uh, it's just so fun to see him out there running and enjoying the run and just just running like the wind. On Saturday, he just he took off with the leaders, and uh, he was out fast. I was concerned that he might have gone out too fast, but he didn't. And he just ran strong the entire race, stayed focused the whole five miles, and, um, and threw in some surges of his own. And uh, and finished really strong and just blazed the last the last sprint in very very nice race very mature racing and couldn't happen to a, a nicer guy and especially as a senior it's awesome. Well, we've talked a little bit uh, about just how having a season, being able to get together as a team, running races has really been a positive as far as mental health is concerned probably not only for your athletes, but for you yourself as a coach, the rest of the coaching staff. Can you just talk about how that's been a big positive for your, uh, for your program? Well, I, I will never forget the, the um, after we were able to race at Olivet uh, this September, September 19. And after a spring of cancellations, after a summer of you know, just all kinds of talk about, well, I'm not sure if we're going to have a season or not. Um, to actually go there and be able to race and be able to go out and challenge ourselves. These kids were euphoric. I can't tell you how, how full of gratitude they were to be able to race, to be able to go out and do what they love to do and, and challenge themselves. The, you know, just the way that they they thought about themselves and carried themselves was like at 100 percent capacity. It was so healthy mentally and emotionally for them to be able to do that. And, um, you know, there's you have to combine that with being safe, of course. Okay, so, you know, we're running a cross country race out on a golf course. There's there's plenty of room and they had alleys so that, you know, when we when we raced, we stayed off into our alleys and we minimized the number of runners there were. Uh, So we were safe. We even finished in different alleys instead of having a common finish line. Uh, But I'll tell you, these kids being able to go out there and give 100 percent of what they had was so healthy for them. I really thank um, 
Dr. Timmer for fighting and just trying to have a season and President Leroy for sticking with it. So many of the other presidents um, just, you know, just said, no, we're not going to do it. You know, there's there's too many concerns and it's going to take too much work. But our our university uh, did it and it made all the difference. Well, we want to touch a little bit on uh, the family tradition at Kelvin. Of course, you've been uh, the cross-country coach for, I think it's uh, pushing 36 years now. And, of course, you ran at the University of Michigan, uh, ran in three Olympic Games and the steeplechase and all that type of thing. But you've certainly been a huge part of uh, the fabric of Kelvin University athletics over the years. But uh, the rest of your your family, extended family and immediate family, have been part of – Kelvin Athletics. So let's let's just talk about your in-laws first of all. Let's first of all, you know, you were just mentioning your wife was a part of the first ever Kelvin Varsity Women's Track and Field team, and then uh, she had a sister who was a standout volleyball player who uh, was part of a Final Four team for volleyball, a league MVP. I think that was Kim, and then uh, uh, let's see, um, Kelly, I think was the All-American 400-meter runner who we had speak uh, at the C-Club Awards just a few years ago. She's a professor down in uh, Kansas City area. And, uh, you know, they they uh, really uh, been a part of the rich tradition. So just talk about those three sisters there. Yeah. Well, you know, I when I was, um, when I was dating Carrie, then my wife Carrie, then I was at the University of Michigan, and she was at Calvin, and she joined Calvin's first track and field team. So she, the um, the women's uh, track and field team, and um, so yeah, I I wasn't at Calvin, but I I spent time studying in the in the library at Calvin when I would come <laughs> home and you know, come home for the weekend. So um, anyway, yeah, Carrie uh, Carrie ran for two years. And they even went to nationals in uh, in the relay, the four by one hundred meter relay, and uh, that was that was quite something. Of course, uh, she's a Lautenbach, and Don and Shirley Lautenbach have been huge supporters of Calvin Athletics, and so so uh, Kim and Kelly and and Carrie all they all ran track and field, and um, and Kim played volleyball and. Of course, Jenna has played volleyball now at Calvin, and um, yeah, there's there's just been uh, yeah a, a great heritage of uh, of the Lawton box and and Deemers that have uh, have gone to Calvin, and they've all gone on their own. They've all made their decision to come to Calvin on their own. Nobody forced them or twisted their arm. But uh, my three daughters and my son. Uh, came to Calvin, and uh, they all participated in in track and field, cross country, and uh, yeah, it's it's been really good. I think uh, didn't Kelsey play low basketball too, if I remember correctly? <laughs> well, of course, I remember you playing a little basketball back in the days. I've been a part of uh, those Calvin yeah. cross country into the season remember. parties. Those are yeah. interesting basketball games. <laughs> 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 that that's for sure. There's yeah. no fast breaking or cherry picking. I can tell you that those guys get back on defense really well. Yeah. They can run. <laughs> <Good> so <laughs> uh, speaking of running, I got to ask you a final question. So I'll, th- we recorded her interview a little earlier and we asked Annie needs uh, if coach Deemer was going to run a race in the women's cross country uh, team where would he finish? Would he finish in the top 10, the top seven? You're saying number one. Number one. Number one. These, well, what, these I, kids, what these kids don't realize is, <laughs> you know, they, they uh, physically, okay, I'm, I'm 59 now. And, uh, you know, I may not be able to do everything that I used to do. But, you know, when, when the mind gets put to work, it, amazing things can happen. I'm so, sure. Well, I, I, I will would, let the you would not beat me. I, I, I would let the cat out of the bag. I will let the cat out of the bag and just say that Annie said that you would be in the top seven. You still are very speedy, but you would not beat her. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
So maybe well, we'll have to see how fast you can run on Saturday. Race going on. Yeah, uh, yeah. There you go. Go figure so, it out. Runs a steeplechase in track. Yeah, I know it. We, oh, we I that. Yeah, exactly. I, that would that'd be exciting. So yeah, final question then. So Saturday, um, there is a meet at Kelvin. Um, we're kind of unofficially calling it the Kelvin Crazy Year uh, Championships because this has been a wild and crazy year. So who are who's coming to compete, and uh, what can we expect? It's it's just going to be um, Olivet and Adrian and ourselves, and that agreement was made early on with um, with the athletic directors and the presidents of of our three schools. Uh, Trine had had said that they were going to do that, but now they have um, they have ended their season. So it's just going to be the three of our schools, but we are, we have all agreed to testing and we have agreed to safe protocol. And uh, you know what? It, it has been so worthwhile going through the extra steps, um, allowing these kids to be able to train, to be able to to race, to be able to look forward to something. Uh, it has been very healthy. So um, uh, all of our kids are and coaches are extremely grateful to be able to have this season. Well, we're grateful uh, to have you as our head coach and uh, grateful to have a chance to follow you uh, this fall with actual competition. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, we want to thank you for stopping by and taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, Brian. You're very welcome. Now, hopefully I don't pull my hamstring trying to out <laughs> Now that that I feel like I have to show her who's boss. <laughs> well, the gauntlet has been thrown down. What can we say? Uh, well, it should be fun. Yeah. All well, right. Thanks. Very good. Thank you. Well, that was a great interview with uh, Coach Deemer. And, and we, again, thanks, Phoebus. We'll bring him back a little bit later in the show. Uh, tonight's student athlete interview brought to you by Lake Michigan Credit Union. Lake Michigan Credit Union has more ways for your money to earn even more. Choose from CDs, health savings accounts, nationally recognized credit cards, and a checking account, Money Magazine, called the best checking account in America. Well, our student athlete interview tonight is from, is any needs from our women's cross-country program. And I'm going to turn over to my co-host, Ryan Souders, as he takes us through uh, any season. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. Andy, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Um, really appreciate it. Tell me, uh, where, where are you coming from right now? Where did this interview find you? Uh, right now, I'm in my bedroom at my college house. <laughs> Sounds good. And originally, uh, you're not from the Grand Rapids area. Can you tell us, where do you call home? Uh, so I'm from Peru, Illinois, which is about two hours west of Chicago on Interstate 80. Okay. And how did you find Calvin? How did you end up uh, coming to Calvin University? Uh, so my sis my older sister actually visited Calvin and decided not to come here. But oh. then a few years later, I visited and really enjoyed it. I'm in the engineering department. And so it's pretty rare to have a good engineering department and good athletics in a D3 school. For sure. We like you better than her anyway. So that's awesome. <laughs> Next question. Tell us a bit about your fall. Obviously, uh, a unique fall in terms of, you know, what you were prepping for versus what you've carried out. Tell us kind of, A, you know, what the fall has actually looked like for you on a day-to-day -day basis, and B, kind of how you and the team dealt with that um, kind of as you transitioned in, into this part of your year. Yeah, so it's definitely been different than I had imagined, but it's been a good season. So the day-to-day -day looks a lot like separating into smaller pods. Our women's team is actually pretty small this year. We have 17 women on it. Um, but so we split into two separate pods, <laughs> uh, which works really well for our daily runs. Our workouts are also split into pods. That also works well. Um, and then the season itself is a lot shorter than normal. We're done this upcoming weekend. Um, and the meets have been a lot smaller, usually between the typical size was three to four teams. Actually, this past weekend, we had a race with 10 teams, but each of the teams only had four women. Our team was the largest with our 17. <laughs> um, so that's looked a bit different, but overall, it's been a really good season. 
Okay, and and to be honest, every time I'm checking, I, I don't know if they call them box scores in running. I don't know if that's the thing, but you guys are like just destroying the fields. Um, can can you talk about that? You know, is there a particular training? Is it just you're frustrated you don't get to race, or you're taking it out on other teams? It just seems to have been and really an excellent fall. You know, on the scoreboard. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, so we've had a really good developing season. We have a lot of girls coming back who have made a lot of great strides in their running careers. And we've also had some runners, both freshmen and sophomore newbies. Um, as for scoring, there's definitely a lot of teams missing from the, uh, the races we've been running that we would normally be competing with. But we've really held our own, especially against, uh, we raced Trine University a couple weeks ago. And they were someone we were pretty evenly matched with. And so that was a really good competitive race. Cool. Well, let me, I don't, I don't know if you knew this, but you actually have something in common um, with Dr. Timmer and myself. So one of the things you do is you run tons of miles every day. Yeah. And, and we do that too, but the opposite. Like we never actually run. So a question from someone who doesn't run to someone who does, right? So I got to imagine other than the excruciating pain of running more than 10 to 15 feet, like your mind play tricks on you. Like in a training run, you're putting together 10, 12, 15 mile runs. Like what is going through your head? Like I never see you guys with music. I mean, maybe you're talking to yourselves, but that, that's got to run out. I mean, what are you, what are you playing in your head for all that time? <laughs> um, you know, honestly, a lot of the time we're just talking to each other. It's really nice being able to run and even our smaller pods being with teammates. Uh, that makes a huge difference compared to running alone. Um, yeah, we like to talk to each other. We talk about just about anything, how our days went, what we ate for lunch, how things are going. Just really any topic is fair game when we're running. <laughs> yeah, um, must, be ni- must be nice to be able to like understand the people and not hear death panting. <laughs> <laughs> while you're moving and I'm, yeah. always think, I'm, and I'm always thinking about food when i'm running, <laughs> running we, we talk food. about food too <laughs> uh, the difference is they've earned theirs jim yeah. so, yeah. Any, any last last question for you as, as you head into you know you said you have a last race this upcoming saturday and, and certainly mm-hmm. good luck there as you come into the winter and and a lot of athletes then transition into maybe indoor track or or indoor you know outdoor track and field what what is your your individual and your team's plan as you kind of head into this winter and spring season what are you hoping for what are you training for um you know what are you hoping things look like so we've been told there's an indoor conference meet so we're really looking forward to that Uh, we're hoping that more teams in the miwa will be able to race um at that point um i guess both race and field events for track and field um one of the uncertainties is what practicing indoors will look like the winters aren't necessarily nice to outdoor athletes <laughs> um sure so that would be interesting but as for the spring semester or the spring sport i guess um i guess kind of same thing hoping for a miwa conference with more more competition more teams more competition just makes it even more exciting to beat them so <laughs> man I hear that we'll like we'll certainly be pulling for you I'm gonna mm-hmm. I'm gonna hand it back over to Jim, uh, and I think he's got a, just a few more questions for you to round out. So thanks so much for being with us tonight. Yeah, thanks. Hey, Annie, it's been great catching up with you, and and I I, I always think these are really interesting uh, ways that people get to know our student athletes besides their GPAs and their and their uh, times on the uh, cross country course or on the track. So I'll call this segment twenty four seconds. Twenty four was twenty four. Seven with Timmer, seven questions in 24 seconds. It'll be longer than that because I'm always longer than 24 seconds. So here you go. First question, last song that you played on your Spotify, iTunes. What what last song did you listen to? The song Eight by Billie Eilish. Ooh, Billie Eilish. That's a big one with the with the young folks these days. I get that. <laughs> uh, TV show you last binged watched. I just finished The Umbrella Academy. Very good show. Oh, I haven't heard that one. Netflix? Mm-hmm. I, yep. am, I am old, man. I, I tell you <laughs> that. Favorite color? Come on, I can... Yellow. Pale yellow. yellow. Mm-hmm. Pale, not Calvin Gold, but pale yellow. All <laughs> right. What is your racing shoe? I wear New Balances. New Balance racing shoes. Yep. 
Really? Do you, are you a Nike person at all for running? I was in high school, but I have since transitioned to Saucony and New Balance. Oh man. Okay. That Maybe that's, a, that's, a, that's my problem. I, I wear, I wear uh, Nike when I run. I got to go to New Balance. That's what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. Favorite class at Kelvin. Ooh, that's hard. Can I give you three? <laughs> yeah. I, I try to get soccer guys to come up with one. So I, <laughs> go ahead, give me three. Okay, top three. I really loved my intro to philosophy class. Um, my biochemistry class is one of my favorite classes. And um, this is strange, but I really enjoyed my thermodynamics class. <laughs> I think it was really interesting. <laughs> Those are the exact same three classes that Phoebus, myself, and and, and Souders would list. I, I, I think I'll take the thermodynamics and uh, Souders the philosophy and, <laughs> and and Phoebus the other one. All right, two more. Loudest teammate. Oh, that's a tough one. We've got some loud- Delaney Saul. Delaney Saul. <laughs> she is pretty loud. She is pretty loud. <laughs> um. You know, I'm going to have to go with Taylor Tempest. She's a fellow senior with me. She's pretty loud. She's a good cheer. All right. Good. All right. This one might put you in trouble with your coach. So oh, no. imagine a race. So Deemer's in the race Saturday on our course, running in the women's race with his team. Oh. Where does he finish on your team? You got 17. Ooh. He runs the full, he's, he runs the full he's six. A, he's an Olympian. He's older yeah. now. He's, he's still pretty speedy. I'd give him top mm, top seven. I'd give him top seven. So, so you're, you're, you're going to beat him? Yeah. <laughs> Over sure. <laughs> Over sure. Well, hey, again, I want to thank you for, for uh, throwing this together with us. We appreciate it. Um, we're going to cheer you on. I'll be there Saturday. Um, and uh, looking forward to it. So thank you, Annie. Thank awesome. You, Annie. Thank you so much. This is fun. Yep. That brings us to another uh, end of another episode of the round table. And as we like to do, we like to give you a little preview of what's coming up at Calvin athletics over the next couple of weeks. And we're going to turn to Jeff to that and we'll uh, preview next episode. Yeah. Uh, so for this week, uh, we've been having these uh, Kelvin inter squad games. Uh, so volleyball has uh, an inter squad match on Wednesday night at 7 p.m. and also Friday at 7. And if I recall my data, I think it's roughly the first 180 or so fans yep. that show up are allowed to come in and you have to sign in, do the contact tracing and all that type of thing. Um, if you come out to the soccer pitch, um, I, and I'll get to that in a minute. I think you have to sign the contact tracing, but there's a little yep. bit more room uh, for you to sit. So uh, let's see here. Women's soccer, as of right now, is an inter squad game Friday at seven. That's all weather permitting. And then uh, men's soccer is scheduled to have uh, an inter squad Saturday at 3 p.m. Uh, Cross country teams actually have their own Kelvin. Uh, I guess we're calling it the Kelvin Championships is what we're calling it this Saturday at the Ganey Athletic Complex. And uh, 11 a.m. is the men's race, and the women will follow at noon. Um, Jim, you might have to fill me in on, uh, I know back in September when we were under different rules, it was two spectators per athlete. I'm not sure if that's still uh, the number yep. that we're working with right now or if things yep. are a little different. No, that's what we're that's what we're doing right now. Curious, Jeff, can you run uh, untethered in that uh, meet? As you know, with the championships, I thought Jim might want to get out there and you know see if he could could hoist it. That that would be some good video for C Club. Yeah, I, I don't see that happening. Uh, <laughs> we can do a little hey, TikTok uh, video. Um, hey Ryan, any uh, words for the next two weeks for Night Nation, or any thoughts here as you end? And before I plug next episode. Uh, yeah, I'd just say 
you know, we got a couple weeks left in, in kind of our fall go at things. So uh, certainly an encouragement to anyone listening, finish up strong uh, in your fall sports, winter sports. We'll, uh, we'll be handing off the baton and uh, man, just love this round table. Excited, uh, excited for next week and excited to see Jim running uh, untethered on Saturday. At the Calvin <laughs> Well, again, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank our guests tonight, Brian Deemer, Coach Brian Deemer, and Senior Annie Needs, Jeff, and Ryan. Always a pleasure. Uh, next episode, we're hoping to have uh, swim and dive coach Dan Gerolos and an alumni spotlight, which we'll leave as a surprise. So with that, we bid you adieu and have a great night.